right with the speakers to give us more time to be able to spend time with the series and the questions and all the stuff that we've been going through. Um, and, and, and then we, we land the plane and just worshiping God for how great he is. Amen? Amen, guys? Um, but can you guys pray with me? Uh, can you pray with me? And then uh, Ms. Quinn, I'll pass it to Ms. Quinn and she'll be able to, to lead us uh, with, with our speakers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, for uh, the opportunity that we have every Friday to gather together with these juniors and seniors, Lord. It's incredible. We're almost through the whole school year, and we've had incredible chapels throughout the year, uh, the way you've been moving, God, through different speakers and through uh, different moments, whether it's been student-led or worship or what all these things. But when we gather here, God, we want to hear from you, Lord. We want to worship you, Lord. We want to give you the praise that you deserve. We want to receive the word that you have for us so that we can walk in it, God. And, and you're doing in this room, Lord. There, there are uh, students and teachers in different seasons of life and avenues of life right now, God. So we raise up those, those, uh, those moments to you, God, that we can trust you. We can uh, know that you're anchored through every season of life, through the questions, through the victories, and through all the things that we have ahead, not just while we're here, but even where uh, as many of these seniors will be going out uh, to the journeys ahead that they have uh, in their future. May they find the rock in you, Jesus Christ, Lord. So we love you, Lord. May you guide us in this chapel today. We pray and we pray these things in your name. Amen and amen. Amen. So today um, we are continuing in series that we have called Questions with God. And we've been actually really trying to dig in and receive some of your questions. Um, we had a, a form that went out. We've, we've had places where you can offer questions. And we've been answering those. And actually today was scheduled to be Pastor Mike Legier, fan favorite, right? And he was going to be doing relationships. Well, do not worry. That is coming. He is going to be answering a lot of the questions that were put forth um, on relationships, um, not next Friday, but the Friday after that. So we're going to have um, some of those honest questions that you all asked about relationships and about dating and about even our sexuality answered by Pastor Mike um, on the 26th. So look forward to that. But ladies and gentlemen, there are times in, in our community, in our life, in our walk with God, where we really need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And I pray that that is what we are doing right now. When we walk in faith, we are supposed to be focused on God and listening to the Holy Spirit. And in a rather sudden pivot that we believe is Holy Spirit-led, um, we are going to be answering questions today. And if you remember, as our community has walked through this time, as a family in our community has walked through this time of grief and sadness, with losing Sayla, we actually up in Sayla's corner put a place where you could write letters to the family and encourage the family, encourage each other, and we asked you to do that. But we also put a place where you could ask questions. And in the spirit of continuing wrestling with God in really, really difficult things, when life happens, and we have questions and we have doubts. There were questions that was put in that that were put in that basket in Sailor's Corner that are some of the hardest questions anyone deals with. And so in an incredible act of obedience, humility, and love, Mr. Matthews, Sailor's father, has said he wanted to come and talk with you and talk about some of those questions you've had from his perspective. And so this morning, I'm going to ask you guys to sit up and lean in because Mr. Matthews and Pastor Schott are going to be with us today answering and sharing some of what God has done in their life through this time. And so I would like to welcome Pastor Schott and Mr. Matthews. Thank you so much for being here. And I, I, again, we just want to continue to support and love. And again, like I said, this is a profound act of obedience and vulnerability and just a desire to bless and encourage our community. So thank you very much. All right, very good. Good morning, everybody. 
So um, with that introduction, um, you know, everybody's clearly aware of what we've walked through for the past three weeks, and certainly nobody has walked deep into the more deeper and darker areas of this than Mr. and Mrs. Matthew. And so, um, you know, we, we were just discussing over there that a couple, a couple dynamics that could be touchy and weird. One of them is uh, in the very last chapel that Selah was in, uh, Mrs. Quinn was uh, talking about doubts and she picked a couple teachers to speak about their doubts and she picked me to speak on, on what causes me to scratch my head about God a little bit and and uh, the day before the dance concert, um, this, this is the day before the dance concert, I said, hey, the thing that makes me scratch my head the most is when I get a phone call that a student has died and uh, I unpacked that a little bit talked about some of the journeys I had walking with families who have had students pass away. Most of them were already graduated students. And um, I made a comment that could seem absolutely frightening, uh, but as we sit in a, in a position now where we look back on some of that stuff, it's just telling one meta narrative of God. And we're still learning more of the stories. But one of the things I finished with, I said, and I have to be positioned correctly with God because I know that this incident will happen again. I didn't know what happened the next day. But I said, I know it'll happen again. And Sayla actually heard me say that. It's the last thing she ever heard me say, which is kind of crazy to think about. And this is Mr. Matthew's very first time in the theater since it happened. So you can imagine kind of what he's going through right now. But one of the things I've seen Mr. Matthew walk through is... Right now, Selah's story is doing more work for the kingdom of God than I've ever seen in my life. And he, he had a prayer that same day of the chapel that I just discussed, he had a prayer that he said that same day. And I, I'd like you to share that prayer with them, if you would. Yeah, so I was... Uh coming from work to pick up Sayla. She was here at rehearsal, and I pulled up to the parking lot and in the, behind the grill, and uh, I got a text from Sayla. She said she's going to be another 30 minutes. And uh, normally I would just turn the radio on, listen to the radio, or get on my phone, but I just felt the Holy Spirit leading me to just walk around the campus. So I started walking around, and um, I got to the, HSM, the other side of the HSM building and felt like God wanted me to pray for revival. And uh, specifically with the students. And uh, so I was walking around and just praying for revival 24 hours before this happened. Um, it's crazy how God answered prayers, right? And so that's got to be like strange for you to hear. Um, he prayed for revival and he actually sees this as God answering the prayer. Mm -hmm. So what I want to ask you, Mr. Matthew, is... As you think back about that prayer now, with all the pain that you and your family have walked through, you've commented a couple of times about your position about that prayer now. Mm -hmm. What would you share with them as your a position about that prayer that you prayed? Uh, you know, after last Friday, um, it was hard to pray. Um, I didn't know how to pray. But that, I felt like the Holy Spirit was asking me that question, would you pray for revival again? And it was the toughest question that I had to deal with within that first 24 hours. And God just gave me a completely different perspective. He's like, the enemy wants to steal my prayer, um, and I'm not going to let that happen. I'm continuing to lean in, into God. We're running to God despite the pain, um, and I'm continuing to pray for revival. Amen. Um, so, you, you, as Mrs. Quinn said, you guys have asked a couple questions. We're gonna. Mrs. Quinn took two of your questions specifically that she said covered a whole wide range of a lot of the questions that came in, and I'm gonna ask them to Mr. Matthew. And if you can imagine, guys, um, you know how many of you were in chapel last Friday? Yeah. So. 
Uh, you, you saw I had an allergy attack, right? My eyes started watering, all that stuff, yeah. And um, I could imagine uh, Mr. Matthews and I might experience some allergic reactions ourselves. Um, so just know that um, we, we sat with a young man yesterday and he, hearing Mr. Matthews' story, uh, he wept for a good 30 minutes or so in front of us. And I kept asking him, why are you weeping? He kept saying, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why. He says, I'm not sad. I'm not sad. And I said, well, do you think you're weeping because you're feeling love in your heart right now? And he said, yes, that's it. And I said, it's, it, it, you're not in love with Mr. Matthew. You're not in love with me. So why do you think you're weeping like that? And he realized God was kind of overwhelming his heart with love. And he accepted the Lord based on sitting with Mr. Matthew and hearing his stories. So um, there, there, if you see me repeat last week or if you see Mr. Matthew choke up, just know this. It's not the tears of tragedy. They're the tears of participating in something that's so much bigger than us. It's so much bigger than us. And we're still trying to figure it all out. We're still comparing stories and we're still trying to see the big picture. But every time, tell me if this is true, Mr. Matthew, every single time we discover something new, it's glorious. It's absolutely glorious. So uh, one of the two questions that kind of frame the rest of them is we, 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 we got this question here. It says, why do we spend so much time praying if God's just going to do what he wants to do anyway? Such a raw question. Um, that week in, that we were in the hospital, I had never prayed like I had prayed bef like that before. I had never, I didn't care who was in the room. I didn't care if it was the doctor. I didn't care if it was the nurse. I didn't care if I was on my knees. I didn't care if I was crying in front of other people. Um, we were just pouring our, our heart out for a week straight. You know, through that, I could tell you as, as a father, as a, as a married couple for me and my wife, as a family, um, God taught us to pray again. Uh, it's so easy to get caught up in work and family and just the busyness of life and just check the box and say you prayed in the morning. But God truly taught us to get on our knees and pray again. And in that time of prayer, I could, it was almost like we could tangibly feel the presence of God. And once you feel that, you don't ever want to lose it. Despite the pain, despite not having our prayers answered the way we wanted it to be answered. Um, once you taste and see that the, that the Lord is good, you just want to keep tasting and keep seeing that. And we did that happened to us when we were on our knees when we were in prayer um, and that's something that has changed us profoundly um, going through that as a family we never felt we were alone we knew god was doing something in you guys we saw so many of you guys came by and to hear your prayers um, your boldness um, your knowledge of the word um, just coming into her room and declaring life over Selah, coming alongside of us uh, and just, you know, I saw, we saw your faith and that we kind of fed off of your faith at the same time. And just the, the way, hearing from teachers, how a lot of you um, weren't used to praying uh, out loud in front of other people and how by the end of the week, you guys were praying these bold prayers and, um, and not just the students, just our community in general, our church, you know, we had, uh, <coughs> We were part of a 21-day fasting and prayer at Calvary Chapel Parkland, and uh, one of the gentlemen had said he was going to get there at 5.30 in the morning every morning to open the doors and just allow whoever wanted to come by in the morning and pray. And um, a lot of times he was there by himself. Um, sometimes he was there with maybe two or three other people at 5.30 in the morning. But the Saturday after this happened, there were so many people there that were praying. So through it all, God taught us to get on our knees again to intercede for each other, something that I'd never really understood before. Um, it blew our minds that there were people in, that had never met us, that had never met Selah, that were in different states, that were praying for us. 
Um, and they were saying the same thing. They had never prayed for somebody like this before. God was waking them up at 1.30 in the morning, and they felt like they were called to be praying for us and interceding for us. So I feel like with the, the body of Christ in general or our family in general or you guys as students, he, he taught us to pray, and that, was, that has changed me profoundly. Um, I feel like it's changed our community. Uh, I truly feel from the bottom of my heart there's a greater purpose. There's something coming down the road where we're all going to have to be in that posture of prayer. And the only way we're going to hear God is if we're in prayer. The only way we're going to know what to do is if we hear from God and the, we're believing uh, that there's a greater purpose. We don't, I don't know what it is. I don't have all the answers. Um, My prayer life will never be the same. So one of the things you just said in your answer was um, that prayer allowed you to experience the presence of God. So, um, you know, when the question is, you know, if he's going to do what he wants to do anyway, why do we pray? Well, sometimes we do see in the Bible that he will change his answer based on prayer. But many of the times, he's trying to change the person praying so that his will can be done and that person that's praying can be in the right posture to respond the right way to what's going to happen. So without all that prayer, I don't think Mr. Matthew would be in front of you today. I think he'd be at home, doors closed, just wondering how to, how to get through the day rather than looking for what God wants to do with him today. Is that fair? Yep. yep. Absolutely. So second question was, Sayla spent so much time working, studying, and taking hard classes, but now she's in heaven and will never think about another exam again. What's the point of working in life if it's not going to matter in the end? How did, how did all of her hard work pay off for her? Yeah, I love that question. It's so real. Um, you know, part of Selah's story is her walk with Christ, and she was called during her season here to, be, to have that excellent spirit in her. So she was walking out her walk, and she was walking it out in obedience. Um, she, had, she knew what Christ was calling her to do, um, and that's part of her testimony. I think that's why she's touched so many people's lives is because she tried to do everything with excellence. Uh, she got, uh, she kind of coasted through elementary school and middle school. She was able to kind of study at the last minute and still get an A. Um, she came here as a freshman, <coughs> got her first B, and uh, mm -hmm. kind of kicked her into gear. <laughs> she realized she couldn't just coast anymore. She actually had to study and get organized, and um, which she did, because uh, she knew that's what God was calling her to do, and sure, her reward in heaven is, um, is waiting for her because of her obedience. It's not that she needed that to be obedient to, to gain salvation, but um, she was just obeying what Christ was calling her to do, and he wants to see us walk that walk uh, each and every day. I don't know when my last day is, but I'm going to do today with excellence. So one of the opening verses last Friday that I gave you was, a good name is better than fine ointment. And we talked about how good Selah's name is, that everybody that, I don't care if you mentioned dance, I don't care if you mentioned academics, I don't care if you mentioned friendships, I don't care what area of life you mentioned, Selah's name came up as gold in those conversations. And one of, the, one of you guys that came forward last Friday, um, mentioned to me afterwards in tears, you know, that they want their name to be good too. I want my name good like Selah's name is good. So why all her hard work? Because that's what made her an inspiration. Um, for you guys, hard work is going to probably pay off in a college degree and a good career and all of that. But her hard work was for something different. Her hard work was so that this type of response could happen at her death that people could be inspired and people could go, I want to be like that, I want to be better. If she had apathy and laziness and if she was a, a procrastinator and all that, none of this would have happened. But she's so inspiring. So her hard work paid off in far more than a degree. 
far more than a career. Her hard work paid off because she's serving as a life changer now for so many people. So um, I had to ask Mr. Matthew on the way in here um, because there's been stories nonstop, nonstop. Um, so I asked him, you know, what stories do you want to focus in on for our, our very brief time together here? And, and so um, one of them is, is this. Um, you know, he gets a phone call. His daughter's in medical trouble. They run to the hospital on a Thursday night. And <clears throat> one of my worries from that Thursday night forward was, when are you going to have alone time with your wife? <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. When is it going to just be the two of you trying to navigate these waters? But the, the plus side of that was what? We were, from the moment we got there, um, even in the ER, we weren't alone. Uh, there were teachers from here. Dr. Rachels was there. Um, we, we feel like we never walked through this alone. The, when I say the body of Christ was truly acting like the body of Christ, it was from the teachers, from you guys, um, Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, the pastors, we attend Calvary Chapel Parkland, so our pastor, our community there, uh, my mom's church, the Indian community, um, our family. We never thought we were alone. If you came to the hospital, you knew we weren't alone because it seemed like there was always 30 or 40 people there. Um, and through that, you know, I felt like Moses when he had his arms raised up and he, you know, he was getting tired and needed people to come on along both sides and lift his arms up alongside with him. And we felt that's who you guys were. Um, every prayer, every text was holding our arms up. Uh, we never felt alone um, because you guys were there and we never felt alone because we knew God was there. And it was, uh, it's one of the craziest feelings because you see your daughter in a, in a, on a ventilator and you're seeing one thing with your eyes but you're feeling the presence of God and it was truly, truly an amazing experience. Yeah. Um, you know, as somebody that's in this community um, every day um, for the last 22 years, I have never seen this community shine so much. Um, from the prayer we did at the flagpole to literally every, every day, everywhere on this property, people express love and concern uh, for this family and um, the willingness to do whatever. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it type of um, attitude from so many people. Um, I'm so, I've never been happier that this is my community, that these are my people here. I've never been happier about that in 22 years of being here. And I hope that as God gives us a lesson to learn, that we really, really learn it, and that you bring this sense of community and create community where you go from here. Because ask the Matthew family how important that is, um, to really belong to a, a community that has unity. When I say unity, um, I don't mean like we give you guys uniforms so that you kind of look the same. I'm not talking about that type of unity. I'm talking about a unity that has a common purpose attached to it. I don't care how different we are. The more different, the better. But that our overall purpose is the same so that we're going towards the same person. We're going towards the same goals. We all want to be in heaven together one day. And so with that common unity, we have community. And that community, boy, at times like this, means everything. And I quickly about that Tuesday morning at the flagpole, um, at the last minute, God worked it out where somebody was live streaming it. And so my wife is in the hospital room with Selah, um, and she's watching it. And as the doc uh, nurses and doctors were, were coming in, she was showing them what was going on here at school live. And for the do doctors and nurses to see that, I mean, they knew just because of the amount of visitors she was getting, like something was going on. But when they saw that, um, that truly changed them. They, they were blown away to, to watch the live stream that, that this many students would come out to support our family and to support, support Selah. 
Um, they have never seen, they have, they're used to having somebody in a hospital room and getting no visitors versus getting so many visitors plus an entire school praying for, for Selah as a flagpole on a Tuesday morning. So um, you guys truly show them what it means to, to, be, to be supportive, to, to step up. Um, and that blew their minds. They had never seen anything and like so that. So one of the stories of one of the nurses is she, she's, she's living a life that she, nobody, nobody that works with her ever expects her to darken the door of a church. But where was she last Friday night? She, um, real quick, she, she has three boys. She was married. She got a divorce. She's living in a lifestyle now that she shouldn't be living in. Um, but she was so moved by, she's the one that saw the live stream. And she was so moved by just the amount of love and support that, uh, that she saw through you guys. And uh, she came Friday night to the memorial. And this is the from her coworkers, what they've told us, that this would be the last place that she would end up being. But she saw something attractive because you guys were such a light to us and they saw that. And uh, I don't think she's fully grasped it, but she saw something attractive and she wanted to be here Friday night. Yeah, just the people seeing you guys love a family the way that you love the family made her say, I want to be where they are and see more of this. Where that leads to, who knows? But she came with three other nurses yep. that night. So there was four nurses that cared for Sela that were here last Friday night. And after it was all over, they approached me. I told you this, I think, right? Yeah. So they approached me and they said, uh, thank you for everything. Oh my gosh, look at all this. And, and, um, and she said, you know, not many people thank the nurses, but I, I, one of the things that I had said, hey, I want to, you know, thank everybody that, at the hospital that cared for her. And she said, not many people do that, so thank you for thanking us. And I said, well, you know, I thanked you at the beginning because I wanted you to hear what I was going to say at the end because at the end was like the gospel message. And, and, and she said, oh, we were listening. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. So, uh, so, so we had community. So... As I observe, so Jason and I, you know, we go to the same campus. We go to Calvary Parkland. And I would say the extent of our relationship was a good morning, you know, how are you, you know, things like that. We didn't have a whole lot of conversation. I grew a deeper respect for him when he would do a, a Devo for us. And I saw that he had a depth to his understanding of Scripture that some of the other Devo givers didn't give. Oh, my gosh, if they're watching now, that was embarrassing. But anyways... Um, but he had a depth to his understanding, and I knew, okay, this is a guy that knows his Bible. And he's a little bit deep. So I had a respect for him that I never articulated to him until just now on that. Um, but for some reason, I was one of the calls that he made to say, my family's in big trouble. Can you come? And I came, and I entered into prayer with him and his family for the next eight days. And, and on Good Friday... We did about four hours, uh, Sailor's final four hours, we did. And I don't think there was a five-second period where it wasn't filled with either song, prayer, or scripture reading. Right? Nonstop singing, praying, and reading scripture, and of course, crying. There's a lot of crying. But it wasn't... So, as I mentioned in Sailor's last chapel, you know, there's just been too many students that have been here that are not with us anymore. So if you've had my Bible class, you've seen me get super excited about giving you the gospel, sometimes getting very emotional about it. Well, it's because I've seen kids in deaths one day and, and, and not with us in the near future, right? So of course I get like that and shame on me, quite frankly, if I didn't. But this relationship that I had with Mr. Matthew going, I, I said to him earlier, it's like you invited me into your pain. Now, who wants that invitation? But I would never trade the experience for anything. Even though it was a lot of crying, it was a lot of hurting, a lot of looking at him and his wife and just seeing the pain that they're going through. Yet today, I would say that he and I, I certainly feel a bond with him as if 
we went through a spiritual Vietnam together, yeah. you know? There's a bonding now that you went, you just kind of look at each other and go, we've been to war together and we're learning things from the battle that are just glorifying to God. And you would say, oh, then she must have gotten out of the bed. No, she didn't. But somehow God is still being seen as glorious and magnificent through Mr. and Mr. Mrs. Matthew's eyes. And it's like, um, I, I've been offered by admin very graciously to take a couple days off, man. You, you, you've been doing a lot, take a couple days off. And I'm like, I don't want to miss what God's going to do. Yeah. I want to be here. Are you crazy? I mean, it's like, <laughs> it, things are happening. So um, I want to finish with, I don't want to finish, <laughs> but they're going to make us, you know, right? Um, I want to finish with uh, Saturday's uh, graveside mm -hmm. service. And um, I'm going to start it by talking about my car drive there and then have Mr. Matthew pick it up from there. But um, he, he asked me to do the graveside service on Saturday, which if you've heard me talk about this, um, but Mr. Matthew, you didn't know, uh, I always say it's my least favorite thing to do as a pastor, so thank you. Um, it's a very hard and painful thing to do. So I prepared what I prepared, and I had to give three verses for other pastors to read there. So I, I created the script. I didn't create the scripture. I copied the scripture. I gave it to those three guys. But I had just gotten a text from one of you in the room here saying, hey, I want to get baptized on Sunday. And you got to know that fills my heart with joy. I'm like, this is great. This is great. And all the other kids that texted me they wanted to get baptized, I, autom I would right away text or call Mr. Matthew and go, here's somebody who wants to get baptized Sunday. And I asked him to come into the water with me. I said, this is your daughter's harvest, man. You come in the water and baptize with me. And, and so, so I'm driving to the graveside. I get that text and my heart is going, I can't wait to tell Mr. Matthew. But then we're in a cemetery and it's his daughter's casket that we're looking at. And I'm like, I can't be like, hey, guess what? So I was literally praying, Lord, make me sad. Get the joy out of my heart. I was literally praying that. I was like, Lord, I have to be appropriate here. And I was wrestling with God because, like, I don't have the right countenance right now. So I thought, let me focus in on my message. Let me just focus in on what I'm going to say because the things I have to say are not easy things to say, and that will surely kill the joy. But all I kept getting into my mind was a wedding, a wedding theme. And I started seeing the casket close on Selah, and they put a wedding veil over her face before they close the casket. And then I'm so discombobulated, I'm thinking I am gonna make a disaster of this great side service because I plan on going one way. Right now, all my thoughts are going a completely opposite way and I don't have any of it in order in my mind. And so I started thinking about the verses that these guys had. And as they read them, one after the other after the other, I started getting a complete and total wedding theme playing out in my mind. And so I went up to Mr. Matthew and I honestly don't remember what I said, but it was something along the lines of, um, hey, there's going to be this rose ceremony and there's 80, 100 roses, yeah. something like that, that family members had. And at some point we we're going to invite them to go and lay them on the casket. And I, just, to, just to start me diving deeper into this wedding theme, to commit myself to it, I said to him, hey, could you be the last one to put a rose on the casket? And when everybody else puts a rose on the casket, can you just stand in front of your chair? And he said, yes. And I was like, I was kind of hoping he'd say no. <laughs> but he said yes, and now I got to really follow through with this. And is that one I told you what to say, or did I come back a second time? I don't remember. I think you came back a second time. Okay. So then the family's putting the roses on the caskets. And then I came up to him a second time. You could take it from there. Yeah, so while we were in the hospital, we realized there's only so much the doctors could do. There's only so much medicine could do, which we, real, you know, we were appreciative of what everybody did in the hospital. But 
in our hearts, we're like, God, you knit Selah together, not the doctors. Um, and we didn't knit Selah together. So we, we didn't want the doctors to have the final say. We didn't want us to have the final say. We wanted God to have the final say. Uh, so we literally turned, her, surrendered her back to, to God and we're like, we want her back, but you have the final say. And when we, that Friday, when the ventilator turned off and uh, we were at peace knowing that we left it in God's hands and God's will was being done. Uh, the one area that bothered me was as a father, um, I had this picture of me walking my daughter down the aisle and I kept on asking God, why, why did you give me that picture if that wasn't gonna happen? And uh, so that was the, the one area that was bugging me. And uh, that morning, um, it was on my heart. I didn't, I didn't even verbalize that to God. I didn't say it to my wife because I didn't want her to be even more upset uh, knowing that. Um, but it was just something that I was grumbling with in my heart. And uh, at the graveside, when he gave me the rose and he said, would you be the last per uh, one to, to put the rose on, on Selah? And he turned to me and he asked me, he's like, I'm gonna ask you to stand up and I'm gonna ask you, will you give this bride away? And I was just sitting there, I'm like, God, how did you know? <laughs> I didn't even verbalize that, but that's exactly what was in my heart. I wanted to give my daughter away. And uh, he beautifully went through the verses of how uh, Selah is the bride, and if death has no sting, she is the bride of Christ. And I had every right to give her away back to, back to God. And he was obedient to the Holy Spirit and uh, got to give my daughter away to the best bri bridegroom there is. Yeah. So I was, I was literally nervous and scared to say anything to him at all during that because I know where his mind must be and all of that. And um, you know, he, he, people have said, well, thank you for being obedient to the Holy Spirit. I got to tell you, the Holy, I don't feel like I was obedient to the Holy Spirit. I felt like I got my butt kicked by the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I felt like I had no choice. This, I wasn't allowed to think of anything else because he and others have said that, man, that wedding presentation was so clear. And I was like, I, I don't remember giving it. I don't, I don't remember how I did it. I don't remember how I, I don't remember what I was saying. All I was focusing in on was this is either going to be the worst thing I ever did or one of the best things because I thought, I thought the crowd was going to go, how dare you bring up a wedding? Are you out of your mind? What are you doing to this man by doing that? But I, I felt compelled. And, um, and it was the next day when we were doing baptisms together at the beach that he shared with me that um, there's the only part of his heart that's not really been ministered to was I'll never give my daughter away. And he said, so when you came up to me and said, hey, can you give your daughter away to Jesus today in marriage? I saw his tears just come down his face when I asked him that. And I thought, you know, you always think the worst. I thought, I just messed this guy up really bad at his daughter's memorial service. But when he told me the next day that that's the part that he could not get peace about, and then I realized that God used me to minister to, listen to this, to thoughts that were in his heart and mind that he never shared with anybody. He wouldn't even share them with his wife because it caused him such a struggle. He certainly was going to add more struggle onto his wife's heart. And so he shared it with nobody. This was very private thoughts, very private concern. And so now I realize that when he heard that he had the opportunity right then and there, that God knows our thoughts. He knows what you're thinking. So many times in scripture, it'll say, 
and the people murmured amongst themselves such and such. And then Jesus goes, hey, why are you murmuring that amongst yourselves? And they're like, the guy hears our thoughts. He hears our secret. The story of Nathaniel under the fig tree. Jesus is nowhere near him, and he knows exactly what the guy's thinking and feeling. And, he, and because Jesus' love, he was able to minister to Mr. Matthew in that way. And that's the God we're talking about. That's your God. That's how God's going to work with you through all of this. Um, I went to get a frozen mocha in the uh, grill yesterday about 8.30, and I saw men's, the, the dad's Bible study happening in the corner. And I didn't see Mr. Matthew there because you're normally not there, correct? Uh, not there every week, but yeah. Okay, well, I, I don't remember him ever being there, but what do I know? So I was going to go over there, and because these guys like to laugh it up and everything, I thought, I literally thought as I was walking up there, I'm going to say, what is all this heresy I'm overhearing from this table? But when I got there, I saw Mr. Matthew was doing the talking. So I was like, ooh, I don't want to say that when Mr. <laughs> Matthew's talking. Okay. So, um, but I also saw tears coming down some of the men's faces. And so they, he, he was just sharing with them about the, the graveside service. And I had a 930 meeting with a graduate that has seen too many of her friends pass away. She almost passed away, but she survived. And she kind of goes, you know what? You know, I overdosed on drugs. I made it. I'm so glad. But I had a friend before overdosed on drugs. She didn't make it. And now just recently she had another friend overdosed on drugs and she didn't make it. And she's kind of saying, why am I here when they're not? But what really drove her to meet with me yesterday was saying, Sale has done nothing wrong. That wasn't an overdose. This is a girl who's always doing it right. So why am I here and she's not? So she wanted to ask that very tough question. And so I was thankful that I had ran into Mr. Matthew because I go, hey, I got an expert on Sale right here with me. So I asked him if he wanted to sit down at the table with us, and he's, absolutely. And I got to just sit back and watch him minister to her and literally saw her light up like excited, couldn't believe what she was here and just so excited, totally appropriately giving her condolences and, and respect for, for what he's been through, but just getting pictures of God that she couldn't put the pieces together before and leaving with such joy in her heart. But then we weren't done because another young man came to our table and um, his situation was, I don't know why I'm not choosing God, but I'm not. And I don't know why. And Mr. Matthew began sharing with him and sharing with him and sharing with him. And I, I think for a solid 30 minutes, the boy was weeping. Is that fair? Yeah. And so um, through these stories, through Selah's stories, his heart started making him weep. Mr. Matthew got up to use the bathroom. He got a call from the Parkland campus pastor. And I don't know why he called you, but Mr. Matthew ended up saying to him, hey, we're right on the precipice with somebody. You know, his heart seems to be breaking. Please pray, please pray, and all of that. And while that was going on, I asked this young man, why are you crying? And he goes, I don't know. I'm not sad. He goes, I'm not sad. This isn't sadness. And I said, is it love that's breaking your heart right now? And he said, yes, it's love. And I said, you don't love me like that? You don't love Mr. Matthew like that? So where's, what is this love for? And they realized it was God. Hearing these stories that Mr. Matthew was sharing broke his heart. And he felt overwhelming love. And he gave his life to the Lord in the grill yesterday. And good chance he'll be with us Sunday getting baptized. Okay? Right. So why did Sailor's hard work, what did it pay off? It's paying off, listen, more than my hard work ever paid off, okay? Why do we pray? Because God does change things, but more often than not, he changes the people that are praying to be able to still see his beauty, his, his glory, no matter what comes our way. 
So Mr. Matthew is, and I told them this right before we came in here, he's the guy that built his house on the rock. He didn't know anything like this was coming. He had a mom that got saved. That mom shared with her siblings. They, shared, they all grew up, got married. They shared with their spouses. They shared with the kids that they raised. They have a legacy of faith going through this family. And so with that house that's built on the rock, a storm came to his household the rain came, the wind beat against it, and this man and his wife are still standing, and they're standing gloriously, exactly like Jesus told them they would. And if he built his house on the sand and didn't do the things that he learned through Scripture, then I could tell you stories that we've walked through with families who lost kids, and it's just not pretty at all. So thank you for being so willing to share your story. I think it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. And, um, you know, you guys have been moved in ways where um, we have one of you sitting here who's really trying to get the story out into the public schools. Um, he just got done telling me he's praying for the Weston Christian um, community for various reasons. He's praying for that community. The boy that came to us yesterday, he's like, hi, I'm so-and-so. And I was like, how long have you been at CCA? Uh, this many years, but I came from Weston Christian Academy. We're like... Give me a break, all right? So um, let's hear it from Mr. Matthew, his willingness to come on the stage and share. Yeah, getting a standing ovation in the back there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are they free to share your daughter's story out there? Absolutely. We want to... You know, when we're in the hospital, we read every resurrection story possible. Uh, we read Jairus' daughter being raised, we, Lazarus's, Lazarus being raised, uh, the widow's son being raised. But my sister reminded me yesterday of the story in 2 Kings 13 where Elisha, who had done all these miracles, uh, the word of God says Elisha died sick and he was buried. And in the next few verses it says, the Israelites were in such a rush to, to bury somebody, they literally just kind of threw a body on top of Elisha's bones and that person was raised. And that was a resurrection story we didn't hear about in the hospital, but when my sister shared it with me, um, Selah's, we buried her body, uh, but she has touched so many of your lives and the resurrection that we are praying for, we are believing, we are going to see it in each and every one of your lives, the resurrection power uh, in each of you, in your future, in your marriages, in your college careers. We are going to continue to see that resurrection power through you guys. And I'm, I'm excited for what God has for you guys. If you need more prayer, if you need to talk to somebody, find your favorite teacher. I'm right here. <laughs> no, kidding. Find your favorite teacher. Um, let us walk with you because uh, it, there's more stories to tell. Um, today, tomorrow, we know, we know the story's going to keep unpacking. So God bless you, Mr. Matthew. Thank we you. so thank you for being here. Please stand, and we're going to sing a song together. All right, just dismiss. Pray. Dismiss. Okay. All right, let's pray together. Mr. Matthew, would you close us? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to your presence this morning. Lord, your word says this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it despite the pain, despite, despite everything that we're all going through individually, despite what we're going through as a family. Lord, we know that you are good. We know that you love us. We don't always have an understanding of what's going on around us. We don't always have an understanding of your purpose and your plan, but we know that we know that we know that you love us, that you have plans for each and every one of us. Lord, help us to seek you out even through the pain. Help us to run to you during this time. Help us to keep our eyes on you no matter what happens. Because you are where our hope is, you are where our joy is in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Lord, I thank you for every promise in you is yes and amen. You promise that you never leave us, you never forsake us. Lord, I thank you for the school, I thank you for Dr. Rachel, I thank you for Dr. Mr. Mills, I thank you for Mr. Alfenar. 
every single teacher, every single administrator here, every single student. Lord, you have knit this community together to be here at this time. Lord, help us to hold each other accountable. Help us to love on each other. Thank you for the shining light that the school has been to our family. Help us to reciprocate that each and every day to a lost and dying generation around us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Thank you so much. I do want to say this, and I just, I just want to let you know, there are many of you now who have expressed an interest in being baptized. One, I would encourage you to talk to your families or to your pastor, but we also are going to be having a baptism. Mr. Schott is doing a few baptisms of students this Sunday, so talk to him if that is also an option for you. At noon at the Pompano Pier. Thank you.